These are the folks that are on the panel today. So myself, um, as well as David Cannon, uh, David Crouch, so the two Davids, um, we've got Richard DeCock here and Brian Flora as well. So um, yeah, do you just guys wanna go around and give a little bit uh, about yourself, maybe tell a little bit about your origin story, kind of how you came to, to be involved in ITIL or in this ITIL project? David, do you wanna go? Yeah, I, I can start. Um, I've been around ITIL since 92. Um, I was at the time a VMS system manager. <laughs> um, and when I found ITIL, it was like, I wish I'd known this stuff before. Uh, and so started using it. Um, immigrated to the States in 2000 and, um, sorry, 2001. And, um, yeah, been involved with uh, implementing, using ITIL all of those years. Um, and finally, someone convinced me to get involved in writing. Um, yeah, I don't know what they were thinking, but here I am. Awesome. Uh, so next in the order of the pictures, let's go with uh, David Crouch. So uh, I, I always like to say I fell into IT sideways. So I really started off um, on the uh, financial management side. So worked doing uh, a lot of financial management for the centralized IT department at Johns Hopkins and, uh, and had various roles there for uh, about 20 years. Um, and, and some years ago, I you know, heard of this company beyond 20. I started to get interested in, in what is this whole ITIL thing all about and took a first class, uh, an ITIL foundation class for version three. And, and I kind of came back from the class and I think people thought I had joined a call. I said, you know, similar to what Dave Cannon said, this is really great stuff. I wish I had known this. And, uh, and really, and, and, you know, at that point over time, realized that to have credibility with IT, you have to learn the technology side. And so learned a bunch of actual technologies as well as the business that supports it. Um, so now I, uh, you know, I, I've been working for some years now as a senior advisor at Beyond 20. So work on the consulting side and also on training. And I uh, was really fortunate to, uh, to, to begin working on this book. I, I like to, uh, I used to like to refer to the ITIL version three authors as the uh, service management demigods. So I'm hoping, I'm, I'm aspiring that one day I can, be, I can be one of them by writing more and more stuff. And I have plenty of adjectives. <laughs> Thank Richard, you. what's your story? Oops, sorry about that. Yeah, so I, um, I come from a service desk manager's background, and uh, my story was baptism by fire when um, I was handed a spreadsheet of about 500 users, and that's how I had to manage support calls of uh, an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, needless to say, when I got introduced to things like ITIL, uh, you know, there, there was no, no denying that that was a much better way to manage um, that experience. Um, and in terms of that, you know, my career took off from there. I became a trainer in it um, in service management, worked for multiple service management firms, uh, became a management consultant just generically for a while, then ended up working at Microsoft where I'm now helping our customers, um, you know, streamline and optimize their, their IT operating models um, to be more digital and cloud centric. And in terms of the book, um, I was, it's an interesting story. I was on a beach in the Bahamas and it was this late starry night when suddenly out of nowhere, this guy with this tuxedo appears and gives me this envelope and says, your mission, if you choose to accept it, I wish it was that exciting. Um, the actual story is that uh, <laughs> I'd done a lot of formal research on digital transformation um, a few years back, especially around uh, service management. And David Cannon was uh, kind enough to be involved in that pro in that process. And uh, when he got put onto this project, he uh, he called me up and said, you know, uh, would I like to get involved? Met with Erica, of course, and the rest, I guess, is history, right? It is, and my favorite story about Richard is you came on the team uh, a little bit later than some of the other authors. And when he was on the when he first came to his first meeting, I was like, Richard, where's your chapter? Why isn't your chapter done? And he was like, what? Oh my God. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Brian, what about you? What's your story? Yeah, so I, uh, I kind of fell into IT probably, uh, you know, sideways, just like David, I guess. I was, uh, um, I was kind of a, a serial entrepreneur, I guess. I started my first dot-com in 1990. 
five, uh, uh, you know, online e-commerce business. And I basically just got in IT because I had tech problems and didn't have any budget to hire anybody else to do it. So um, ended up going and working for uh, some other, you know, uh, startups. So GoDaddy.com for about four or five years from the time we were in, you know, Bob's garage out to, uh, you know, the first 5,000 employees or so. And then uh, been, you know, doing this with Beyond 20 since 2006, gotten the opportunity to work with a lot of different organizations, including uh, uh, stint at the U.S. State Department and, and uh, several different uh, public and private organizations. I actually was teaching that class that David was speaking about back in, I think, what would have been maybe 2010 or something like that. And uh, I don't know, I must have just had pretty good mojo that day, I guess. I think there were about 10 people in the class, and I'm pretty sure that three of the students, three of those 10 ended up working at Beyond 20 at some point or another. So uh, <clears throat> I don't know, I've got to try to try to capture that lightning in a bottle again, I guess. But uh, happy to be uh, part of the ITIL4 authorship team and getting a chance to you know really contribute and, and give back to the community that we've you know been part of. and. Uh, so enmeshed in for the last dozen years or so. Awesome. And then just really quick, um, I thought it'd be helpful to tell a little bit of my story too. I, I think I came to to this thing called ITIL, which we'll talk about for those of you that are on the call that have no idea what the heck we're talking about when we say this acronym. Uh, I was a microbiologist turned project manager turned, I don't know, I got sucked into IT and I was working actually at Pfizer many, many years ago. And they were like, what is this ITIL? We think it's like IT best practice. Um, we were trying to help the organization be a, a lot less chaotic. And uh, they were like, you go out, you take a class, you come back and you tell the rest of us if any of this stuff is really helpful. And I came back going, yeah, this stuff is really awesome. Um, and that's really what this next slide speaks to is the way that I kind of describe I told these days is I, I tell folks, it's really just lesson learned from the global tech community that, that have been captured, have been put into books uh, that organizations can use to help them collaborate, help them deal with the stuff that's going on around them, um, and that they can use to build upon in their own organizations. Um, this DITS book in particular, it's one of a series of five. Um, it's the last of the, actually of six, five at the intermediate level. There's also a foundation one, um, but this is the last of the series that has come out, and uh, it was released, I think, last month. Um, both electronic and, and hard copy. You can get it off of Amazon. You can go to um, the stationary office out of the UK and buy them there as well. Um, and not only is it a book, there's a course, there's um, also an in-class assessment and there's an exam um, that's actually very cool. The, the in-class portion of it's awesome. Um, David Cannon and I have both taught um, the class a few times and uh, folks actually work through a case study and activities where they say, okay, what's going to be your digital strategy of your organization and it allows digital leaders to really flesh out these concepts we talk about in class. It's, it's pretty awesome. Um, so this is just a quick list of some of the stuff in the DITS book. Um, I don't know, David Ken, if you want to maybe talk through some of these things and just kind of give folks a highlight as to what's in the book. Oh, I, I can do that. Um, <laughs> you on the spot. You're I, welcome. <laughs> I, I think also uh, also to really talk a little bit about the uh, some of the philosophy or thinking behind the book that informed some of these uh, subjects as well. And of course, any of the others, please chime in on this. So I understand that we're we're dealing with a digital transformation group here, and uh, digital transformation was was. Uh, has been an area that has provided a lot of information um, uh, content um, input to this. But what was interesting to us is that a lot of the digital initiatives within organizations are not necessarily transformational uh, or they're not necessarily, they don't necessarily start off as a project in which we're going to transform one business process or, or, or whatever it is into something else. Uh, and, and, and increasingly, they're not restricted to a particular technology. So it's not just about, well, what is the strategy for implementing machine learning? Um, uh, or how are we going to use Internet of Things? 
they're broader than that. They're more strategic than that. And so organizations are tending to ask questions that are more enterprise uh, like in nature and not technology like in nature. But there's a big overlap there because the, the way in which enterprises are developing is by using this technology, this emerging technology. So there is a, a very big overlap between where people are coming at it from a digital transformation. Here's a specific set of opportunities. We're going to transform using those to here's an enterprise and we want to grow our enterprise within this context where the, all of the rules of society and business are changing. And uh, we, we had to bring those two kind of perspectives together. And so when we talk about the vision, it's not just about how do we implement or how do we transform a particular aspect of the business. It's really about how do we, how, you know, how do we operate and how do we ex, uh, uh, succeed as a business within an environment that has been so disrupted and continues to be disrupted by a number of different technology uh, uh, trends. Um, you know, some of which are transformational and some of which are evolutionary. Um, and some of which are just, um, you know, putting away the old and updating to the new um, without really changing much else. How do we bring all of that into perspective and, uh, you know, and, and, and talk about how we, how we strategically look at that from an enterprise point of view? So we're really looking more than as a technology strategy. We're looking at this from an enterprise strategy point of view. Um, <laughs> with the understanding that organizations cannot create a strategy today unless it is based on digital capabilities. Uh, and that's, that's kind of the departure point. I think I've said enough on that. I think uh, I'm, I'm going to hand over to somebody else to, uh, to give their perspective on this list. Yeah, no, I, I agree with all of that. Um, thank you, David. I, you know, I think for me, more than anything else, as we were, you know, uh, developing the table of contents and the original syllabus that, you know, as, as my fellow authors know, was uh, an arduous process that went on for much longer than you would probably expect. But, you know, at the core of it, we set out to write a, a book that we wanted to read, right? that, you know, we wanted to, to create something that was basically a handbook for leaders on how to execute on digital trans uh, transformation and, and those kinds of things, but also, a way for, for people to actually evaluate, you know, the risks of going forward with a digital transformation and, and, uh, and to really in a practical way, be able to look at, at, you know, the costs and benefits and, and uh, potential pitfalls of, of going forward in a really practical way with this. What of course we didn't anticipate when we set out, when we began writing this was that it, you know, the theories that we were setting down on the page were going to be tested so dramatically uh, you know, we were in our, basically our final manuscript stage at the point at which everybody started locking down in, in uh, March and April of, of 2020 here. And uh, what we found is that, you know, a lot of organizations had digital transformation on their roadmaps, they had plans, but everything got really accelerated, right? We went from you know, hey, this is something we need to do in the next four or five years to how do I get all of my workforce, you know, working from home tomorrow and feel out, you know, and, and how do we find new and, and uh, new ways to interface with our customers? Our customer journey has entirely changed, right? The, and, um, and so we got a chance to, you know, kind of see these things put into practice and to make some modifications and, and so forth. So um, it was, uh, it's been an interesting year in that sense. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I, I think I'll add to that a bit. Some of the questions that I really wanted um, to get to have included in the book are, are things like the stuff on this slide, like how do we create a compelling vision, especially in, like you said, pandemic times, where um, you know folks are, are everything's upside down. Our customer needs are shifting. Um, how do we lead our teams out 
of, uh, you know, out the other side of this. Um, we actually changed a couple of chapters, one of which um, that was added was around VUCA. So how do we, how do we help our organizations navigate a volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous environment? Like what are the different approaches that we can take? Um, how do we actually become a lean and agile organization? How do we get rid of waste and work on the stuff that's really important? Um, how do we look at, it, Tom, it was, it was really interesting um, listening to you go through the slides because you were talking about the big stack of disruptive tools. How do we as leaders look at those tools and say, and discern, is this something that we need to look at as an organization seriously, or is this something that for us is a fad? Um, and, and how do we make that decision? Um, so those were some of the things, oh, and how do, how do we create a, um, a, or foster an innovative culture? How do we start to do that? I think those were some really interesting questions that we answered as a team. And, and yeah, Brian, you're right. We had a whole pile of stuff we could talk about and we could put in the book. And, and it took us a long time to write that table of contents because we said, okay, well, what are the things that are true of strategy no matter what, um, digital or otherwise? Um, and, and make sure that it was very timeless. You know, when you start putting emerging technologies in the book, then it starts to become a dated book. So how do we make it so that it's, it's a little bit more timeless? And I don't know, Dave, other David or Richard, any other thoughts on that? I, you know, I think that's a really, a, a really great point, Erica. I mean, uh, you know, I, I often say that, you know, when you hear this term digital transformation, it, it's kind of like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. It's becoming my own cliche. Um, <laughs> Because I say it a lot, but think about think about you know some of what Brian said in terms of um, you know the pandemic. You know, if if you're an organization and now everybody is suddenly working from home and you have to find a new way of contacting your employees or your customers, whoever they may be, um, you know, having basic technologies, you know, conference calling abilities, Zoom type tools, is kind of a starting point, right? Like you need to have that. But on the other hand, like that alone is not sufficient. You know, so it's, it, it, technology is great. And when you see, when a lot of folks see digital transformation, they, they're, I think they're prepared for a technology sales pitch. Um, and those tech, many of those technologies are great. You know, they're very useful and we need them. But then the further question is all the things on this page, how do we use those technologies to fundamentally change the way we're doing business? You know, and it's, and it's not, it's no longer a matter of, how can the IT department do a great job of supporting the business? You know, th there's that too, but it goes beyond that to say, how can the business and IT truly partner so that we are actually changing the way we do business? We're not, we're not being ruled by the technology, but we're fundamentally changing the way we work. And, and part of the way that we do that is by having technology, you know, these technological evolutions, uh, changing technologies. So that's, that's what I really, you know, took away from it, trying to say there's a lot of information out there about digital transformation, but how can we define that? Um, how can we define some of the, the best practices, if you will? How can we frame this as something that goes beyond technology itself? Yeah, and I'm going to skip around on these slides a little bit. So we pulled some diagrams from the book that I thought would be interesting to speak to. So I'm going to... Um, spin the, the virtual roulette wheel and David Cannon, I thought um, this was a really interesting diagram um, that speaks to the, what the other David was just saying about, about strategy and how it's kind of all, speak to this. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so this, this is an interesting concept and uh, please understand that as we were writing this book, we were learning this is such an emerging area and and the things that are in this book really represent a lot of the learning that we had to go through and learning that doesn't necessarily exist within other sources um so so going yeah on, on this one what you'll see on the left hand side is you know the, the the more traditional view of strategy which is you have a business strategy or enterprise strategy and then from that everybody goes away they take the strategy they figure out what their part is they link that into the budget and uh, because it's always aligned with the budget. In fact, a lot of people wouldn't even do strategy if they didn't have to do budgeting. But that's another, that's another issue, right? It's, and it is a real issue. But, but what happens here is everybody goes away and they do that. And you can put in, uh, as well as an IT strategy, you can put a marketing strategy and a manufacturing strategy and whatever else you want to put in there. And then at the end of the day, some architect pulls it all together and, uh, and, and makes it all link up and, and so on. It, it's great. 
The only problem is this takes so long, one, and two, it's really no longer accurate. The, the world of digital and IT are no longer separate. So, you know, the argument is uh, we've been doing digital transformation ever since they plugged in the first computer and started automating business activities with that computer, uh, whether those were business in the commercial sense or in the military sense. Um, today, uh, you know, the digital strategy is no longer something you can easily separate from an IT strategy. For example, how do you separate out the fact that we're using Zoom as part of our digital strategy from the fact that we need the, we need the skills and people to manage that from an IT point of view, networking, et cetera, et cetera. These two are not really easily separated. So what we're seeing emerging, and it's still busy emerging, that's why you see the arrows in, on the right-hand side, is we have this digital and IT strategy, these two areas kind of moving together and overlapping. Um, you know, early, early digital transformation or digital strategy projects tended to have a chief digital officer that was in charge of them. And, and, and this poor person sat in the middle between a business unit and the IT department and try to get the two to talk to each other so that they could actually figure out what their project needed to be about and how to manage it. Well, that, those worlds are coinciding now. The, the, the role of the chief digital officer is now largely in most organizations uh, evaporated, gone away. And it is being replaced with a number of shades of combination of IT and business. You know, you, you have IT departments becoming brokers. You have IT departments fading away completely and being embedded within each business unit. Um, and these strategies, it's because these strategies uh, are, are kind of coming together. So we really had to write for a world in which this is happening. It hasn't completed yet. We don't know how this is going to go. In fact, Richard will have some very interesting perspectives about you know, the future where organizations may not even have an IT department at all, that IT is a core uh, business skill that every business leader needs to have, at least a component of it. You know, so we don't know what's going to happen there, but we know that this dynamic is taking place and we had to write for that. Um, yeah, okay, again, said enough. Um, I'm sure someone else has a perspective on this. Sorry, I muted there. I was going to say that was uh, spot on. Uh, you know, the thing I would add to this is that, you know, as we look at this, a lot of organizations in the past used to think about, you know, digital strategy being, you know, hey, we're going to start selling our products online, right? Instead of just making people come into the store, we're, we're going to have a website and we'll sell things online. But, you know, as I mentioned before, I started my first, you know, e-commerce company now almost 25 years ago. That's, that's not new and that's not enough now that ultimately when we look at, at a digital transformation in the way that, you know, we've been talking about it, we're really talking about, you know, kind of three pillars, right? You're looking at number one, uh, changing your customer experience, right? Changing the way the customers of your, of your business or your agency interface with you, changing the employee or looking at, we talk about employee journeys and customer journeys, uh, looking at, at improving the way that employees interface with you as an organization, whether they're on premise or remote. And then finally, when you, if you're in an organization that has sales teams, looking at, you know, transforming and making it easier for those folks to, uh, to sell your products. So, you know, there's some conversations going on in the chat window about, about retail and supply chain and so on. And that, you know, all of that is, uh, obviously important as you look at a digital transformation, you know, that sort of industry has been looking at this for a while, but really looking at that entire sales experience and how do we make that um, easier on, from, for all parties involved. Yeah, and I wanted to switch gears just a little bit kind of on this topic. David Crouch, you brought this up initially around what is digital transformation, but I know Richard, this diagram comes from the research that you did. Can you talk to us a, a bit about this? And I'm also really interested to know more about the research you did and kind of what that experience, you know, what you took away from that or what you learned from that. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I did uh, some formal research around this a couple of years ago, and it was really to try, I mean, the, the hypotheses at the time was that, you know, we've got all these converging views and, and thoughts around what this, this new thing called digital transformation was, but there wasn't really a clear definition 
for us to all sort of hook on to and be like, right, okay, so that's what we should be doing. That's how we should be doing it. And over the last couple of years, there's been some great authors who've come up with some great work on how you should approach it. And uh, they, they gave their sort of narrative and anecdotes around, you know, what, what it is and, and where you should be heading. Uh, one book that I would highly recommend for anyone wanting to get a good firm grasp on the topic would be Leading Digital. Um, I think one of the catalysts that got the whole movement going, in fact, which is based on the actual industry research regarding what makes an organization um, a digital leader versus one that's, you know, going to be, you know, that whole disrupt or die um, topic or chant mantra that's been shouted out over the years. Um, but what I did was I, I, I try to find out, well, if, you know, how do we define it? Um, I, I've, my hypothesis is that a lot of organizations are really battling with the idea and, and the, the mo you know, gaining the momentum to be able to effectively um, do, a, you know, real transformation within the organization. And I believe it's because we don't have clear definitions around what a transformed organization should look like. One of the key elements is that we shouldn't be focusing on the technologies because they're changing so fast, we can't keep up. What we should be focusing on are the capabilities that we're needing to uh, create, you know, that customer experience, you know, how do we do innovation? And really it's a dance between how we get customer insights in, and get our strategy changed really quickly to you know, um, address changing behaviors. And then how do we make sure that our operating model can pivot and change really quickly to accommodate those changes with sort of leadership and governance surrounding that to make sure that the whole experience is, is sort of fluid and, and, and works. And what you're looking at in terms of the slide is um, I went out and I looked at every possible type of definition I could find uh, in official publications, on websites, on blogs uh, around what digital transformation is. Um, and this was around about the 2016 sort of period. And I review this constantly, so they're, they're, it's, it's still completely up to date. And I try to draw out what are the key themes each one of these would would touch on it. And the findings was that no single definition really touched. You know, we didn't get a, co a full comprehensive definition of what what it was. And and my research sort of published a um, a, a recommendation a recommended definition. But what you're looking at here are these are these are the key themes that were derived from. Um, those definitions. In other words, these are the areas that we need to be focusing on um, as as part of our discussion around, you know, what are we going to be doing uh, strategically? You know, um, how are we going to make sure that our operating models are aligned? How are we going to get information from our customers? Um, what is value? What is value in terms of digital to our customers? Um, and, you know, how are we going to get new revenue streams in digital sort of on, on digital products and, and so forth? This is just providing a landscape view as to, you know, these are all the key themes. You need to go out and define for yourselves, for your organization, what does digital transformation mean? What does your end state mean? How, how would you define, you know, what your organization would look like as a, um, uh, a digital company? Because that is what's going to set the trajectory and the momentum for you to be able to succeed. And I think it really just boils down to making sure that you have sustained competitive advantage uh, in the market, in the digital market. Th those capabilities need to be giving you that. Um, and that's, in a nutshell, uh, what this was supposed to represent. I think that's great. Yeah, I also look at this and think that these are pieces of our organization that are going to change. To think that we're going to go through a digital transformation and it won't impact how we lead, how we lead our teams, you know, the products and services we provide, you know, our whole um, interface with our customers, like this will dramatically change everything. Um, one other thing I wanted to jump to, and David um, Crouch, I'm going to pick on you, um, is this idea of a digital positioning model. Um, and for those of you that aren't aware, um, David Crouch um, invented this. Uh, and if you could kind of talk us through what this is, how an organization might use it, um, I thought this was a really cool part of the book. So, uh, so you know, a lot of organizations are, are forced into digital transformation, you know, whether it's because of a pandemic or because, you know, you have some sort of competitor, in, in many cases, in certain marketplaces from completely different fields, from, from areas that you never even expected before, they come into your, into your marketplace and suddenly are, are starting to engage with customers in different ways, offer products that have never been offered before, use technologies in ways that we haven't seen before. 
Um, so in short, a lot of organizations are unreactive, um, either because they're forced into it or just because they are very sort of mature in some sense companies. They've been, these industries have been around, for example, for many decades, even, even centuries in some cases, but haven't really become up to date on how to use um, technology to transform the way the organization engages with, with customers or the marketplace. So the digital positioning model really suggests that we should be more intentional around understanding what digital positions we want to try to achieve and what are the practices or capabilities that we can develop to take us there. So very much aligned with uh, what, what uh, Richard was just talking about. When you look at these digital positions, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive here by any means, but the common ones that you see are, we really need to transform the, the consumer experience or the customer experience. This is going to apply to a lot of business to, to, uh, to end consumers and in some regards, probably more than B2B type organizations, but could be more broad than that. The other one would be operational excellence. So within our own organization, we need to improve certain operational aspects of what we do, um, you know, to, to really, uh, you know, increase the speed of what we're, uh, of things that we're doing, decrease costs, that sort of thing. The other two positions would be, we want to transform our industry. So if you look at a lot of um, organizations that don't have really this, uh, that their customer is really another business, uh, another business, a mining company is, for example, come to mind. Um, you know, what they really are often focused on are transforming the way they work within a particular industry, but not necessarily caring, uh, caring as much about like a third party consumer like me, who may be well down the chain of, uh, of somebody who would consume something from that industry. And then the other one would be transforming the market, you know, just offering products and services that have never even been thought of before. I didn't even know I wanted these things. And suddenly you're able to offer me a product or a service or a way of connecting with me that, um, that just you know, kind of blows my mind. So what does the digital positioning model do? Think of it as a game board. Think of it as a compass, if you will. It basically says that we should choose one or more of these positions and understand that we can use um, what ITIL, for example, would call practices. Um, you might think of it more broadly as capabilities. We can, by improving specific capabilities, accelerate and improve our ability to, to improve these positions or to achieve these positions. So for example, there are certain practices that are probably going to align a little bit more closely with operational excellence certain practices that are actually going to be focused much more on improving our consumer experience. Um, and again, think of these, you could, you can kind of rearrange if you were using a tool like this, rearrange the game board to suit your own organization's purposes. This is by no means um, prescriptive. But one of the things that I suggest to folks is if you take a look at these uh, sort of peach colored um, hexagons in the center, Hexagons were on sale that year when ITIL 4 was coming out, so, um, or the year before that. So um, if you look at the, the peach color ones in the center, this is what I call the zone of confluence. So there's this possibility that if you are, for example, trying to improve your customer experience and also the operational side, many organizations see this as a, as a win-lose proposition. We either spend our time, money, and resources in improving operations, or we spend the time, money, and resources on improving the customer experience. Well, guess what? In many cases, you could do both at the same time. Figure out which practices are going to give you essentially more bang for your buck. You know, maybe our organization is really weak in metrics. So maybe we're able to put to use tools, deploy tools that will both give us a sense of operational metrics that are key to reducing our costs, which in turn helps us to um, helps us to invest more in, in the customer experience. And maybe we use some of the same tools in, in this sort of single plane, uh, pane of glass uh, you know, approach that can measure the customer experience. And if we're really good, how can we relate the two? That, and that's just one example. So, you know, really the digital positioning model, as far as I can tell, is the first model that matches these concepts of, dig of digital transformation with specific ITIL and service management 
um, practices and capabilities. So thus, you know, trying to marry more closely the worlds of IT and the worlds of service management with, with the business. Yeah, and to add to that, one of the things that I thought was really neat about what you did, David Crouch, was um, we did a lot of research on what's out there. Like we wanted to write a digital playbook or look at digital maturity models. And what was out there was very kind of one size fits all. Like everyone wants to get to the top right. If you think of like the Gartner Magic Quadrant, everybody wants to be the you know, the digital master. And that's not necessarily what success looks like for every organization. So what I like about this idea and some of the other ideas in the book is that it's, it's here are the tools and let's figure out what, what our path to success looks like. It's not a one size fits all. And, and our journey is going to look different than another organization's. Um, Real quick, I'll just show one more diagram and, and David Cannon, if you would talk to us um, about this, um, as well as you did a lot of writing around digital leadership. I'd love to hear your thoughts on yeah. that. Uh, the, the two concepts are really linked. Thanks, Erica. Um, first off to uh, Michael Imhoff Nielsen, who's on the call, uh, joining us from Denmark. So you can add that to your list of countries. Uh, Michael asked the question, is OT also included in that? That's operation technology. Increasingly, yes. Uh, so we're seeing a lot more of the operational technology, things like manufacturing, pipeline, infrastructure management, that is not necessarily IT being included in in um, in this because they're being managed uh, intelligently. Uh, so that's the short answer. Of course, there's a much longer discussion with this, but to this diagram, and it kind of fits into this. What we saw here is the phenomenon that that uh, strategy. Uh, cycles are shortening. And in fact, what's shortening the, 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 the cycles is very much what is leading to everything else in this book. And that is that technology innovation is happening so fast. It is so pervasive. And, and uh, in other words, it's not just individual pieces of technology. It's the entire stacks that are being, uh, that are being innovated. The way in which people are using that technology is very innovative. And it happens very, very quickly. So if, if, if you have a very long strategy cycle, one plus years, one to five years, you're going to find that you know, within, a, within a couple of months of, of, of implementing that strategy, uh, that it's already out of date. And so organizations are having to reduce their strategy review cycles dramatically to be able to deal with that. And so any organization today that has an annual strategy cycle and only reviews their strategy once a year, is finding themselves uh, in, in serious trouble. Uh, so you're starting to see these, these cycles um, uh, really growing much shorter. And then another thing happens is that the initiatives that come out of those strategies tend to increase in number, but decrease in length. They're more iterative, they're shorter term, it's get something out now, it's then improve on it, it's then build it further once, uh, once we understand how it's being used. and you know, what impact it's had on our, on, on our organization and its market. So this is one thing that's happening. And then aligned with that is when you're in the situation where you have to work really quickly, we got to use the word agile. Of course, I'm not referring to a methodology here. I'm talking about the fact that you have to be really quick, nimble, uh, and, and, and responsive um, to when things happen. Uh, and, and that creates a different, the need for a different type of leader. And in this book, we called that, that type of leader a digital leader, uh, not implying that they were virtually real, but they're actual leaders who are leading within the context of a digital organization, within a digital management uh, environment. And one of the big things that, that these leaders need to do is facilitate the different culture that has to emerge to manage these really fast strategic cycles and strategic and implementation cycles. Um, you know, and, and, and what that means is it's a leader who understands both sides, right? It's a business professional, but it's also a technology professional. And, and, and those two roles, those two types of capabilities need to be wrapped into the single leadership role. So what these leaders are doing is they're creating what we call the digital mindset, which just simply means the ability not only 
to digitize your organization or digitalize your organization, depending on what term you like, but also to, um, to, to keep looking out for new business opportunities and, and, and evaluate those business opportunities and have that done at every level. Right? So the old plan, build, run model where things would take a year or longer to get through and people would just do what they were told uh, and informed what their new jobs were going to be, that doesn't work as well in this type of environment. In this type of environment, you need multifunction work teams. They need to be, uh, you know, they, they need to change in their composition over time. People need to be empowered to make decisions right at the, at the, at the point where the work is being done, where customers are being interacted with. You can't, you don't have the luxury of being able to shoot things back up the chain to get permission to do things. So that doesn't mean governance goes away. Governance is exceptionally important, but it's a matter of how do we make that governance fast, uh, easy, enabling, empowering. And, and those are some of the challenges that we had to write about when we were writing about digital leadership. Um, and just one last point to make is that, you know, what the other thing that comes out of this, and I mentioned the word already, is innovation. There is no way you can be and you can compete in a digital environment if you do not have an innovative way of thinking and a good innovation program. So part of digital leadership is to, is, is to make sure that that is happening and it needs to happen at every level of the organization. To tell, to tell Dove on that, I mean, it's that I think the biggest challenge organizations have, large organizations are starting the whole process of transformation. If you look at systems theory, uh, a lot of people end up trying to change the elements of the system and the elements really don't have an impact. Transformation means really redefining the entire core of your organization. And that's a tough thing to do. It's built on so many different layers that have been um, laid and layered across the years, uh, you know, changing customer requirements, et cetera. One of the, the most important ele elements to getting this right is your, 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 your governing structures and your committees and ensuring that information is flowing at a rapid rate. A lot of uh, agile purists would state, you know, that is very bureaucratic approach to, to being agile. But on the contrary, what we're finding is that if someone's able to make decisions far more quickly and you're using these structures to enable more autonomy uh, further down in operations, you're going to get a much more responsive organization uh, and getting that structure right is really important. And autonomy is is a really, really important aspect of effective agility in, uh, in, a, in a digital environment. Absolutely. And in the interest of time, we do want to leave some time for questions. Um, but I figured I'd put up this last slide and see um, if any of our panelists want to talk about some of these other topics. I know... Um, uh, David Crouch, you did some really interesting uh, work on parallel operating models. And Brian, I know you and David talked through digital risk and, and, and how that could potentially impact us. So I don't know if you want to give some comment on that. Sure. So, I mean, with parallel operating models, the, uh, the big issue here is, is we know we, we need to, to uh, you know, evolve digitally, but how do we how do we keep the steady state running? We don't have the luxury of starting up on day one in most cases, right? How do we how do we keep the business running while we're transforming? And there are there are different ways of doing that. Um, you know, in in some cases, an organization may say we really need we we are in the past. We're living in the past, and we need to very consciously and quickly move away from what we're doing. You know, right away. Use any of if we're still profitable at all, and that you know make some money and and move towards the new model. In other cases, maybe not so quickly. Maybe it's more gradual. Maybe it. Uh, maybe in some cases, we can actually do business in two different ways um, at the same time. You know, not easy, but sometimes that happens. So that's the concept of uh, really around parallel operating models. And um, it really kind of feeds into this concept of digital risk. So, uh, so coin this sort of uh, acronym. Of course, we have to coin an acronym that that works at least in English, uh, DICE, right? So for the, the uh, specific digital risk, you know, and inspired by things um, like VUCA, inspired by uh, other, other sort of prompt lists that are out there for a risk. But uh, when people talk about digital risk, they often think only about the cybersecurity risk. 
and the information security risk. And that's a very important element, but we have these other risks out there as well, right? We have risk to um, our organizational culture. We have risk to uh, the financial side, right? We have risk in terms of the way we engage with suppliers. So I think uh, you know, when I hear digital risk, I hear a much broader, a much, a much broader list of, uh, of issues that we have to deal with. I think, yeah, another really important point there is understanding, I think a lot of people and there there's a huge misconception around what an operating model is. And I think we, as an author team, did a, a good, a relatively good job at um, defining that and, and the context of an operating model against a business model. We use these words a lot, but in practice, when we're having conversations, we, we tend to find that the, the real you know essence of what these mean is lost. And I think this book does a really good job of defining that, packaging that, and then bringing into a really powerful discussion about what parallel operating models is. Now suddenly the lights come on. Um, and I think that's really something that's really special about the book is, is the way we've approached that as well. Other last thoughts on uh, things you liked about the book or you, kind of the experience of writing the book um, before we give away a copy of said book? What a bunch of smart people. I think that's uh, patting, our, patting ourselves collectively on the back. But I mean, really, by involving folks from different backgrounds and different fields, I think it made the whole thing a lot better. You know, we, we challenged each other on different ideas. Um, generally, we were aligned with, with a lot of things, but, but nuances and different ways of approaching it. I think that made the, the overall publication, you know, a lot better than what it have been had, had we had two people working on it. And as Dave Cannon said, we, you know, we we learned as we went, right? So it wasn't, uh, this. these are practitioners writing about theory, but how to use that theory in practice and learning as we go. And and uh, yeah, I, don't, I don't know how you can get much better than that. Uh, to that, there's somebody, uh, Tom, I think you mentioned ICL-5. Uh, is there gonna be an ICL-5? I sincerely hope so, because that means that the industry has improved on where we are now. Um, you know, ITIL v3 was what we wrote at the time with what we understood about the industry. And it was great <laughs> for about six months. And, and uh, <laughs> then things just shifted and changed. And so ITIL 4 came about. There are more shifts coming, a lot more. And uh, I don't think that this, this version of ITIL certainly gives you the tools to deal with those shifts. But, we, but I can see ITIL 5 coming along um, uh, maybe not in the next five years, but certainly I, I sincerely hope that it'll be there. I will not be part of the authoring team. Some of these uh, younger guys on here, uh, yeah, they, they're shying away, but they will be there. Yeah, let's let's give some poor person, no, no, not poor person, I'm sorry, some incredibly lucky person a copy of that book. I can attest that this, this book, I have a copy too, is the best sleeping medicine you could possibly hope for. <laughs> <laughs> don't you read it every day when you wake up in the morning <laughs> no last thing at night is the day okay. i never make more than about half a page no i'm kidding of course it's, it's it's enthralling it's thrilling stuff you you should definitely get a copy i think it what it does is it just takes a lot of noise that's in the industry today and it kind of just packages it in a an easy to digest uh sensible approach to digital i mean it evolves every day and it's changing every day so David and everyone else's point, it'll be out of date, I'm sure, in, in, in the next few years. Um, but it is at least a stamp and a line in the sand for now. So whoever's really battling with all this noise about which approaches to take here and there, et cetera, it's, it just brings it all together nicely. And I think that's where the value of it is um, for practitioners out there today. Yeah.